everybody. Wow. Eight years of Portal 47. This is our eighth anniversary open house. We mark every year of the portal uh, with an open house like this, with a guest, with a sample of our live features, our telebriefings. We've had an Ask Dr. Trek roundtable, and now, well, we have special guests every month bringing the best of the backstage creatives, all the all the parts of Star Trek you have no idea, you had no idea about. And uh, I say the best guests were the, the biggest names anyway. We have great people all year long. And we say the very special folks for our open house, because that's when we open the doors and let everybody in to sample our wares, so speak. And look, I'm going to get right to it. Um, I'm so thrilled this year to have the great... <laughs> One and only savior of Star Trek number two, Nick Meyer, writer and director of Star Trek two and Star Trek six. The co-writer, these are co-writing, co-writer on Star Trek four, consulting producer for the first year of Discovery would have been writer of the second episode. And currently, well, we'll find out what's up with his project, the con miniseries. Uh, we'll find out what's up with that tonight. So. Here's Nick. Everybody, I'm so thrilled to have Nick with us tonight. And you have been good, sir, increasingly, even over the years, of not not tiring of talking. About, although I would imagine it does get tiring at times, but hopefully fresh and new ways to talk about it. If you're not familiar with Nick's book, The View from the Bridge, this is a, this covers the basics for you. And it's there. But what I um, was hoping we could do tonight, sir, was maybe talk about the things that either you don't think people talk about or the people, you know, and the process. And of course, we're talking about, well, your 7% solution, the book and time after time book in the movie and, but Star Trek two, Star Trek six, writing and directing, writing Star Trek four, and even the things that happened along the way in between the cracks. You mean like making a living and yeah. Falling, well, in, was... lo falling in love, having children. Yeah. <laughs> you mean life? Are we talking about life? life? Those things. Sure. All that okay. stuff. Yeah. Life, the universe and everything. No, I meant even even the bits along the way. Um, and again, uh, the things that, you know, that are fun stories. I've got some pictures here, but not not trying to be comprehensive, obviously, and be an encyclopedia entry, but just just seeing what comes up in, in storytelling, you know, through the years, as in uh, they ask you to come, not to not to jumpstart this, but they they ask you to write to work on Star Trek three. And you said, no, been there, done that right. And or well, not, no, that's not why I said it. I said, what is it about? And they said, it's about bringing Spock back to life. And I said, resurrection i don't think i know how to do resurrection um so <laughs> you should pardon the expression go with god uh because maybe he knows how to do it anyway um so mm -hmm. leonard stepped into the gap and uh, saw this was a way to uh change careers and put himself into the director's chair and i guess paramount was not thrilled with this idea at the beginning because i remember leonard calling me at my house one night and saying michael eisner who was then in charge um was trying to you know saying don't make your directing debut in a movie where you were also the star uh, that's a lot to to bite off yeah uh, what do you think nick and i said leonard are you prepared to let the ship sail without you and he said absolutely i said then sit tight you're going to direct the movie that little counseling i don't say counseling session but uh the fact that uh you helped launch leonard's directing career at least with that kind of a that kind of leverage. Well, I, let me back up then. Um, I, I, you know, I, I work with Harv a little bit on my documentary and some other moments. And I got to hear him talk about his entree to Star Trek and Bloodhorn's challenge to him. You know, can you make a movie cheaper than one hundred and 
$150 million. And he said, Mr. Bluehorn, I can make three movies for $150 million. It was, uh, it was $45 million, which was the number of Star Trek, the motion picture. $45 million, okay. I think, in 1979, which was at that time a runaway production. And most of the special effects were, were unusable. Um, but it still made money. So the so what Bluthorn said to Harv was, can you make a movie for, you know, less than 45? And Harv said, I, I can make five movies for less than five. Right. So then how did so tell us um, how did you get sucked in or pulled in or invited in? <laughs> yeah, well, sucked, pulled, invited. Um, I had directed, uh, I guess, time after time. And I was interested in making a movie of a screenplay that I wrote called Fifth Business, F-I-F-T-H Business, by the Canadian author Robertson Davies. This was my obsession. And I didn't want to hear about anything else. And time was going by. And it was, a, as I recall, it was a Sunday night where I was living. And in my backyard, I was making hamburgers for two friends. And one of these friends, a childhood friend named Karen Moore, who was then an executive at Paramount, she uh, had produced, she and still produces stuff, um, but she had been Louis Mal's assistant on Pretty Baby, which oh. had been done at Paramount. Yeah. And she had done such a great job of sort of covering Louis's back um, that Paramount decided to make her an executive. And there she was, you know, kibitzing with me while I was flipping the burgers. And she said, you know, you can't just sit up here holding your breath because you're not getting to do the movie that you want to do. If you want to learn how to direct, because I'd only directed one movie, um, you should uh, go direct something else. Why don't you go down to Paramount and meet Harv Bennett? Um, and I said, who is Harv Bennett? And she said, well, he did the $6 million man. He did Richmond man, poor man. He did Mod Squad. And he's been hired to produce the second Paramount uh, Star, Star Trek feature. Because even though the first one cost so much money, it's it still was in profit. So they, and I said, Star Trek. I said, is that the one with the man with pointy ears? <laughs> and she said, you are such a snob, which happens to be true. But sometimes you can hear things from friends. And she says, go down and meet him. You'll like him. And I went down and met him. And I did like him. He showed me Star Trek, the motion picture. I didn't understand that. Um, then he showed me some of the episodes. And when I had been in college and these episodes were on, I had a friend who used to watch them every day. He would be on LSD and he would watch them. And he watched them for 54 days straight. It would, at the end of which time, I believe his wife left him. He was a grad student. Um, I love these details that it's not just that I had a friend that watched it, but I love the LSD, but go up, please go ahead. Well, anyway, I mean, I made an, I, made an impression on you. It made an impression on me. And I guess it made an impression on his wife. Um, he was a PhD student in American Indian studies at the university of Iowa. That's where I was at school anyway. Um, but now sitting next to Harv and watching these things, I began to uh, feel that there was something about this stuff that I liked. Mind you, I couldn't get past the cheesy sets and the silly costumes and all of that. But it was safe to say that tickling the back of my mind was something appealing about this that I couldn't quite put my finger on because I don't think very quickly, as you may have noticed. Um, and no, no. then I remembered it was these books that I read 
when I was about 13, right after my Sherlock Holmes immersion, which was when I was around 11. Uh -huh. Now I was oh, okay. Reading, that explains much. Okay. I was Go reading mm -hmm. now the adventures of Captain Horatio Hornblower, mm -hmm. which was C.S. Forrester. It's the same guy who wrote the African Queen. And um, it was about a, a, a captain in the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars. And he had many adventures and he had a girl in every port, which when you're 13 sounds kind of good. And, um, and I thought, Oh, this Star Trek thing is a sort of Horatio Hornblower in outer space. And that, and the penny dropped and it, I, I still, you know, to be honest, I, I hadn't figured out, what Star Trek was, I had just figured out how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, okay, this is submarines and, and battleships and destroyers. It's the Navy. And then I started jonesing to make my outer space opera. And Harv said, I think this is all in my memoir, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, draft five of the second Star Trek movie was coming in and they would send it to me and, and we'd get going and I'd direct the movie and my deal was made and then nothing happened. And, uh, weeks went by and then I, I woke up and said, whatever happened to that Star Trek movie that we were talking about. And, um, so, I, I called Harv and he said, oh, oh, I I can't send it to you. It, it's not good. He said something more colorful than that, but <laughs> it, it boiled down to that. And I said, well, what about draft four, draft three? And he, back in those days, called me kid. And he said, kid, you don't get it. All five drafts is simply five separate attempts to get a second Star Trek movie. These are unrelated screenplays. I, and the Paramount was really determined to figure out a way to do this. I think they wanted to develop, as they ultimately did, a franchise to compete with George Lucas and the Star sure. Wars stuff. So... I said, well, why don't you send them all, all those scripts to me and let me read them? And he said, really? I said, yeah. And I don't know if he said it's your funeral or what, but because you didn't hit send. You didn't hit send back then. A truck drove up, a van. Uh-huh. And it wasn't just five scripts. It was all the rewrites on the five scripts. And I am a conspicuously slow reader. So I spent another, I don't know how many weeks, plowing through these five different versions. And then I had what I thought was a very clever idea. And I asked Harv and his producing partner, Robert Salen, um, to come to my house and I brought out a legal pad and I said, here's my idea. We make a list of everything that we like in these five scripts. Could be the major plot, could be a subplot, could be a sequence, could be a scene, could be a character could be a line of dialogue. I don't care. We just make a list of all those things from these five scripts. And then what if I tried to write a new script and incorporate as many of the things on this list that we make? And uh, they, they didn't seem happy. Uh, and I said, what's wrong with that? I thought that was a good idea. And they said, well, According to uh, Industrial Light and Magic, which is the special effects house who has been contracted to 
deliver the special effects shots for the movie, they say if they don't have a script in 12 days, they cannot guarantee delivery of the shots in time for the June opening. And I said, what, what June opening? <laughs> this is the only second movie I ever directed. And they said, well, yes, well, the, the movie opens in June on some date. I can't remember. But, um, and I said, well, wait a minute. You, 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 you book the movie into the theater and there's no movie. And they said something like, well, this, this is how it's always done. It which was done like, on the you, first movie went so well, but yes. But, yeah. <laughs> well, like everything else related to movies, this was news to me. And then I jumped off the deep end and said, well, um, I think I can, you know, turn around a script in 12 days. And if we make a list of things, um, but we, we just have to do it now or there's not going to be a movie. And they still were sort of staring at the carpet, as I recall. And I said, well, now what's the problem? And they said, well, we, we couldn't even make your deal in 12 days. And by this time, I was like walking around the room and and saying things like, how come no one ever reads a book in Star Trek? And I pulled down a book which happened to be a tale of two cities a book where everybody knows the first and the last line, even if they never read the middle. Um, and so I, I, they said they couldn't make your deal in 12 days. And I said, listen, do you want the movie or not? Um, forget about the deal, forget about the money, forget about the credit. Yes. Yeah, I was, uh -huh in the advanced stages of syphilis uh and i said but if we just we don't do this now there's not going to be a movie and they said well uh whatever and um so i i later reported this to my agent gary lucchese and gary had once considered studying for the priesthood. And he realized at that moment that he could not have ever been a priest because he wanted to kill me. <laughs> um, anyway, that's... You were just young and foolish. Yes, I'll write the... Let's, let's put the show in the barn. Come on, Mickey, Judy, let's just go do it. Well, the other thing, you know, I, I was also at that time, I was in 10 years of psychoanalysis. And one of the things that I s sort of figured out was that by not doing it for money or credit, I was taking myself off the pressure hook. If, if, if it didn't work, then in effect, it didn't happen. Oh. Um, you know, it was a kind of intuitive sort of ducking method from somebody who doesn't typically have a lot of self-confidence. Anyway, I, I went and wrote the thing um, and somehow produced something that satisfied everybody at least up to that, to that point in order to go ahead um, within those 12 days, about which I don't remember a thing except that my back was out by the time it was finished it was written on a smith corona portable uh electric typewriter and um and then like the constitution of the united states there came a flood of amendments but they never really altered the mm -hmm. the thing and it was mainly my dialogue throughout harve bennett wrote five or six lines and i know what every one of them um, is, uh, you know, this one about would you care for a tranquilizer? Which got a big laugh. Mm -hmm. And Captain, this is the garden spot of CD Alpha 5. And this is your big chance to get away from it all. These are all Harv's uh, lines. Okay. Um, and 
years later when the DVDs came out and I was interviewed for segments about the making of the movie and I told the story that I just told you and uh, a day or so later after I was on camera spieling this my friend Lynn O'Leary who was then head of DVDs at Paramount called up and said the lawyers say we can't use any of that and I said How, why not and they said well I, you wrote it for no credit no money we didn't pay you the, it's going to look bad with the writers guild we're going to get ourselves in trouble and this is like you know 20 years later or something 25 years later right, and you I think the statute of limitations was uh oh. and I said well in that case take me out of the segment I don't I don't want to be in this DVD if I can't tell what happened and she said that's what I was hoping you would say now I have some ammo so she disappeared for a day or two I don't remember and then she came back triumphant and said here's what we're going to do and what they decided had very long range ramification Mm -hmm. for all DVDs. And this was the disclaimer. Paramount Pictures and its affiliates are not responsible for any of the commentary made by any of the people interviewed on this DVD. Think about this for a minute, because what it meant is that instead of just doing these stupid puff pieces where nobody is asking or responding to any tough lines of inquiry any revelations right no real history is being recorded here correct That's insight right we're now we've we've now offering a, a chance of oral history as recounted by various participants and by the way all studios do this now that nicholas meyer clause which was i thought a pretty cool thing not that i planned it obviously um but it enables oral histories to be put onto dvds and by the way they they may not always agree with each other but you'll get rashomon like the different versions mm -hmm. and people's perspectives of what happened or what they recall went into a given movie and nobody is frightened of lawsuits Right. Or the studios aren't frightened of them anyway. So is that going to be your epitaph then? Originator of the Nicholas Meyer disclaimer? No, my epitaph, it's going to say on my tombstone, at last, the plot. <laughs> okay. Okay. I want to I want to jump ahead. This is something I, I ask you about. I And I know it's in the, I know it's also in your memoirs, but uh, I think... And of course, you wrote the script for four. There was interesting back and forth there. The, the... I, I co-wrote it. Yes. I co-wrote yes. it. Harv wrote the outer space parts, and I wrote the recycled time after time parts. Yes. What I wanted to have you talk to us live, though, is what I asked you once before. I don't think people realize how close Star Trek VI that you co-wrote and directed, how close did... it came, yeah. it came huh? to not Go being ahead. made. Oh, we're on to six now. Yeah, I'm just I'm skipping ahead because I want to make sure we get that in. I don't want to. Okay. Yeah. Um. Well, I was asked at a certain point to. I was living in London, and Frank Mancuso, who was running production at Paramount, and Martin Davis, who I think was head of the company. Uh, were in London and they took me to lunch at Claridge's and they said we are not happy with Star Trek 5 we don't want to go out with Star Trek 5 uh, <laughs> you know another way of phrasing it was we think we can get blood out of these turnips one more <laughs> time with, with the original cast do you have any ideas for a Star Trek movie 
you know, we're talking about in the $30 million range. And I never get ideas. So I said I didn't have any. 30 million sounded about right. But that was as far as I got. And then some months later, I was having my annual head cleaning holiday on Cape Cod. And Leonard Nimoy, who is a Bostonian, flew from Boston to Provincetown, which is a 20 minute flight. And we walked up and down the beach and he threw me an idea. And he basically said, you know, the, the Klingons have always been our stand-ins for the Russians. What if the wall comes down in outer space? Who am I if I have no enemy to define me? Mm -hmm. And that was literally, as I recall, all I needed. I just said, yeah, right. We start with a huge explosion, an intergalactic Chernobyl. Klingon Empire is finished. They're going to be the illegal alien trash of the galaxy. What to do? Um, and I just spun it all from there while walking up and down the beach. And Leonard said, well, this is really good. So we, now this is, these events are a long time ago. My memory is not perfect. But we told Paramount and they said, oh, yes, great, great. Um, and then we didn't hear anything. And I was back in London. Leonard's back in California. He goes, do you know what's going on? I said, nope. And it turned out that they hired two other writers to write the story that I had made up. And um, I didn't understand why until later. But it turned out these two writers, A, owed Paramount a script, and B, their price was less than mine, because I'd learned a thing or two after Star mm -hmm. Trek II. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, they hired these guys, and the next thing I heard was, the boys are having a little trouble getting started. And I said, well, send him to London. I'll talk him through it. So one of them they sent to London. He sat in my living room with one of these legal pads while I spieled him the whole thing, which couldn't have been simpler as near as I could make out. And I don't remember ultimately what happened, but it was back to me at this point. And... I had an assistant, a wonderful assistant, whose name was Denny Martin Flynn. Denny mm -hmm. Martin Flynn had been a dancer on Broadway. He had been in the original chorus line. Oh, okay. And he was, he was a very good writer. And he was always coming up with terrific ideas. But at that time, he was diagnosed with cancer. And it was a very strange phone call between me and in London and him and Paramount telling me this. And that, and so I thought, wow, he, he needs something, not just sitting in that office waiting for a phone to ring to occupy him. And I said, come on, we're going to write this Star Trek six movie together. And I said to Paramount, that's my condition for doing this. And so we wrote it together um, and he, he was a very good writer and a very uh, droll person. And that's how that got written. I've forgotten your question entirely. Well, that's the, my answer. What fascinates me is after you wrote it, you had the standoff on budget and the studio heads. Oh, the budget, oh, the making of it. Yeah. Yeah. So the next thing. Once that, but twice. It, it, to me, it's a testament to Star Trek that it would survive a studio upheaval, you know, twice. Um, well, what happened after that, yes, is, okay, they okayed the script. You know, Leonard wanted adjustments. We made adjustments. And he had good ideas, no surprise. And then I took a lease on a house in Los Angeles for my 
myself and my wife and two daughters, and we showed up uh, to do the movie. And it was January of, I don't know, 1990 or 1991, don't remember. And we were all sitting in the office of uh, Gary Lucchese, who had formerly been my agent, was now head of production, and David Kirkpatrick. It was Leonard. It was me. It was my producing partner, Steve Jaffe, and it was Ralph Winter, who had worked on some of these Trek movies. Harv was not there. He he had uh, broken off with Paramount. That is another story. Um, and they said, now we're talking about $25 million. And I said, Tut. no, no, we are not talking about $25 million. We're talking about $30 million because that was what I was offered at Claridge's in that lunch. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to tell me what everybody knew, which was that the Paramount feature division over the last six months had been hemorrhaging red ink with $40 million flop after $40 million flops. And they were now running scared. Um, and I said, um, look, you're forcing me to do the math but I'll do the math for you, which is not my strong suit. But you have $14 million below the line committed to this movie with script and the essential cast. Not even the rest of the cast, but just the, the regular Trek Enterprise crew. You've got $4 million in special effects. You have $2 million in post-production. I think that comes out to 18-something. Where's the movie going to come from and they said will you excuse us for a minute um and they walked out of the room three of them and leonard and harv and ralph and steve and i just sat there for about 20 or 25 minutes and then they came back and they said 27.5 <laughs> all that to just hit you halfway yeah and i said <clears throat> you're laboring under a misapprehension i'm not negotiating i'm giving you information and then i just got very angry and i said fuck this i'm gonna talk to frank mancuso i'm gonna tell him everything and let him make up his own mind what he wants to do because i'm sure he doesn't understand what's going on so I had a meeting with Frank Mancuso, a very courtly man in a lovely suit who listened very attentively. And I laid out all the top sheets for him. Here's the top sheet for Star Trek, the motion picture, 45 million and change. Here's the one made by Mrs. Meyer's oldest, 11.2, I think it was. Then everyone after that, three, four, and five was 41% more than its predecessor, except for the proposed Star Trek VI, which mm -hmm. I've agreed to do for the same price as Star Trek V. I mean, you're not going to do better than that. It's not possible. And he heard me out very courteously and thanked me for explaining it so lucidly. And then I left and he canceled the movie. Good job. Um, and I was in shock. You know those scenes in movies where people are cleaning out their office and they've got a cardboard box and they're putting pictures and papers in the cardboard box? That was sort of what was going on. And uh, I didn't know how to go back to my house in Beverly Hills and tell my wife or try to explain to my daughters that we're stuck with this lease for six months and without a movie and any source of income with which to pay for the lease. Um, so I, I started wandering around the Paramount lot. Maybe it was five o'clock. I don't know. 
and I wandered onto a sound stage that I think was supposed to have ultimately contained one of our big sets. And um, there was nobody there. And in those days, before cell phones, uh, or many cell phones, uh, there was a telephone that was on a stand. And it had a little white light. The phone never rang, but the white light would blink when there was a call. So that if we were shooting at the time, we were not interrupted. So it was just me in this empty stage with my mouth hanging open. And suddenly I see the white light on the phone. And I look around like there's no one there. Very surreal moment. And I pick up the phone. I go, hello. And I hear, Nick, it's Stanley Jaffe, for whom I wrote a good deal of Fatal Attraction. And he says, Sherry, meaning Sherry Lansing, Sherry Lansing and I are now running the studio. I hear you need money. I said, I need $5 million. And he said, you got it. And he hung up. And that and the movie was back on. No, wait, this was all, okay. You, you, what was the time when Mancuso said, find the movies off to that point? Like it was a day or two and you went into the law. I mean, I'm not trying to get, uh, documentarian here but um yeah, a couple of days i'm like when did the palace coup happen that they were out and they were in it was very shortly after that call was okay. it was it two days was it a week i don't know but i can't that's remember what we're talking about right but it, yeah if you look up when stanley and sherry took over because that must have been same day phone call um and just back up a little bit that I think that's what it was. So the other mystery though, is did they have an assistant or somebody who had been scoping the lot, knowing that you were, you had the cardboard box from your desk? I mean, they rang that stage with nothing happening on it. Just knowing you were there. I think they were ringing every stage because they probably, Oh, okay. They probably um, rang my office. And I think Denny was there. Um, and, uh, I think he's, he said, I, oh, I think he wandered over to stage four or something, or maybe it was stage five. And I think they just started, you know, trying to find me. That's well, that's amazing. I, I want to, I'm trying to watch our time too. I did want to, um, uh, jump ahead a little bit. I've got some pictures. I was just going to run through random. And if they happen to conjure up, you know, pictures do that uh, from all the movies, especially two and six. But I wanted to jump ahead just a little bit before we got tight on time. And of course, of course you directed the movie and it, and it put the, put the original cast out on a great, uh, on a great sayonara. All these years later, how did you get pulled into the discovery startup system? era uh that was the work of alan gasmer my longtime agent um who saw that they were gearing up to do discovery and he contacted whoever it was and said you know you should hire my client look at his track record or have whatever he i wasn't on the call so i don't yeah. i don't know what tap dance he did did so then I went and I went and interviewed um Brian Fuller. Um and then I got added to the team. So you didn't tell your agent, hey, go get me into that. He just took it upon himself to to go uh pitch. Yeah, him. that yeah, that's why I have him. Because I, I never do any I never think in those terms. I'm too dumb. Well, you were you were basically walking Brian and then the rest of the staff they had then, I mean, to them, they're like, they're all fanboys at heart going, Oh well, yes. Living legend. Nick Meyer is going to join our staff. I mean, is that something like that? Yeah. I was going to say, that's what I would think. Now we all know that the first year was crazy and, and convoluted and uproar and chaotic and Brian left and, in my way of thinking, there were almost like three generations of writing teams 
by the time the season ended. And it's amazing that it, again, it's because Star Trek has a will of its own and they throw money at it and they make sure that it lands. And it was launching a new streaming service too. But so did you basically like, and you, you were originally down to write the second episode, which became Battle of the Binar, Bin Binars, Battle of the Binar, Binaries. But did you just basically run your year contract? I'd heard some of the other writers, basically they did their year contract and the thing was so sprawling and not finished that they just they just left when they left because that's well, when no, the contract was up is that what happened with you or no i was hired to write the second episode mm -hmm. which was a, a battle in space and i'm good at space battles i mm -hmm. have done a few of them and uh in the writer's room we had made a very specific outline of the action of each episode. And I followed that outline and I wrote my episode. And then I got notes back and said, oh, this episode as written is way too expensive. We need more talk, less action. I guess I'd written it like a feature. Uh, and I said, okay, all right. So I rewrote it as directed with with talk and um and i don't want to start airing um questionable linen here I, but I, uh, I will wouldn't ask you to but there's the hi certain histories uh, known so you know so basically what happened was my script went into a you know a, a kind of a rinse cycle or something and then was handed back to me with my name alone on it but i hadn't written it anymore mm -hmm. it was not I, I don't know what nicholas meyer is artists are not the best judges of their own work to be sure but i knew who i wasn't and I wasn't the person or committee that had written this screenplay, mm -hmm. teleplay. I didn't, and I didn't quite know what to do. Because um, I guess I have my little, you know, coterie of people who see me as a certain kind of brand of something, good or bad. And I knew this wasn't it. So I didn't know what to do. And I spent some sleepless nights. And then I said, guys, um, I never I never criticized it. I never criticized it. I said, I didn't write this. And therefore, I don't think my name should be on it. Mm -hmm. And with some surprise, I said, really? I said, yeah. So I took my name off it. And they took me off the show. But you had a contractual producer. I mean, you're you're credited for a certain amount of uh, producer, like over the top, uh, above the line episodes as a whatever level producer you were. Am I still on? Am I still on? The, I thought you were still in the opening credits. Somebody might. I off the top of my head, I thought you were, but I don't think so. You're totally totally removed from all mention. Okay, even in the opening. Well, I have. I the only time I ever saw that thing filmed was at the Cinerama Dome the night they unveiled the first two episodes, the second one being the one that I had formerly worked on. And the only satisfaction I, I took was that all the things I thought were problematic when I read the screenplay version had all been preserved and replicated in the, on the screen. Hmm. So that, that was it. I, I just checked IMDb and they do have you down as consulting producer for the, the whole first season or 13 episodes. Well, just, prob you know. probably look good. I, I, I didn't, I didn't see the episode, so I can't tell you. <laughs> except for the premiere night, except for the premiere night. Um, well, let me, and we want to, I want to at least get a mention of how the, um, and I know you don't want to talk about it because for one thing, make some news tonight. Nick, is the con miniseries whatever, is that still a live project? 
Yes. Okay. Because it was originally to be a like a three part mini movie or whatever, and then you were talking it at the Star Trek Day that it was a podcast or a audio drama. Or... It's it's now being worked as a radio play, uh, okay. nine or ten half hour episodes, and oh. I guess the thinking is that if it's successful, then we go back to making it into something on film. Okay, well that's the way. Um... Uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe wound up happening, but okay. What? How do you? How do you? What's your feeling on the whole thing? I mean, I would think it would be disappointing not to see it shot live, but are you thinking this is going to be a viable thing? Well, I love radio plays. I won't dignify this by calling it a podcast. We live in an age of euphemisms. Men don't wear perfume. We wear aftershave. Boys don't play with dolls. We play with action figures, and it sounds cooler to call something a podcast than, uh, you know, uh, and years ago when they started uh, coloring black and white movies, they didn't call it coloring. They called it colorizing, as that sounded kind of <laughs> vaguely more techy. Um, so I guess this is... Uh, we call it a podcast, but it's a radio play. And I used to direct radio plays in college. Um, and I really love radio plays. And I'll tell you why I, I think they're cool. Um, and by the way, I'm with you. I, I heard you mention that term podcast like they were using it. But I'm with you. A podcast is two people yapping. It's not a scripted drama. So, yay. Um, I believe that all great artistic media with one arguable exception rely for their success on something that they leave out paintings do not move mm. music possesses no intellectual content words are just code on a page the painting moves when it meets your eye. Beethoven becomes profound when it hits your ear. The words make you laugh or cry when your brain decodes the symbols. It is the imaginary contribution of the audience, the viewer, the reader, the listener, whatever, that puts it all together. Shakespeare understood this very well. In Henry V, the audience says, the, 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 the narrator, who's called the chorus, says, on your imaginary forces work. Think when we speak of horses that you see them planting their proud hoofs in the receiving earth, for tis your thoughts that now must deck our kings. It's about the imaginative contribution. That's when it's complete. But film, movies of any kind alone possess the hideous capacity to do everything for you. Movies could, you know, Ridley Scott, he can do, he, he can do anything. Where do you see Napoleon? You know, whatever else you think about the movies, say, how can this guy do this? Well, he can. And movies can, and CGI makes it even easier. But the result is that the viewer has less and less to contribute. You're talking to the man who fell asleep in both versions of Blade Runner because <laughs> I had nothing to do. Every image was perfect. There was no distinction between an important image and an and an unimportant image. Oh, okay. And and uh, I at no point did I wind up saying, "Who's that? Who's there?" Which, by the way, is the opening line of Hamlet. Mm -hmm. Who's there? Right. I want to know. <laughs> um, and so when I'm making a movie, I'm looking for what I can leave out. And horror movies do this very well. People look at the camera, see something awful and go, eek. And you wonder, what, what is it? What did they see? Mm -hmm. 
so I can't remember your question, but that's my answer. Well, I no, no, that's what I I wondered if it was if you were looking at it as a disappointment to only be a radio drama. No, but, radio is perfect yeah, because yes. it's all your imagination. It's all your imagination. And imagination, by the way, does not need to be trained. Oh, Madge, look at that ring around the collar. How can I ever get that stain out? And right away, we're all imagining the ring around the collar and poor Madge with the stain. Thank you. I had not thought of whisk detergent in years. No, I... The thing about the challenge with an audio drama is that it feels like there's more. I mean, you've got sound effects and you've still got music composition and all in the score. But I would I would think if it's going to be a high level radio drama and it's Star Trek, anything Star Trek is going to have attention. Right. Um, what do you think about like who would do, I can't commit to anything, but I'm just sitting here. The first number one thing is, well, who's going to play con? And if it's a. If it's a radio drama, then I, I don't know. I just I we're are we even there or are you even in the stages of production? I mean, what is there a timeline to this at all? But I was thinking casting, but then it, I happen to think, well, is there a timeline at all? Um <laughs> whatever timeline we had went out the window right. uh some months ago. This is a show, all I can tell you about it, and I've no wish to be indiscreet, that has a kitchen filled with cooks. Let's let's okay. put it like that. There are many many cooks in the kitchen. All right, you caught me there with the drink. I thought that you were going to go on. I hear you, but it is alive and it has a future. You know, it's interesting because when CBS All Access first erupted and Discovery was announced and the air was full of you know future projects and you were. When I think when Alex signed his deal, there were several ideas out there that were rumored. They weren't spelled out. And this was one of them. And then the bill filled up with, you know, four or five live actions and two animated series. And now we've had the streaming shakeout and the strikes and they've gone back full circle to talk about alternative uh, alternative formats like uh, miniseries and and streaming movies. And the Michelle Yeoh Section 31 is going to be a streaming movie. I still think it may be a backdoor pilot just without her. So I don't know. It's almost like it's been so long that we've come full circle back to where, you know, it, assuming everything is, is well done, that, that somebody should look at this and see it as a, as ideal for a small format to, to, to do it, shoot it live action. So anyway. I, sh I sh sure hope so, because I loved my original three scripts. I thought <laughs> they were bitching. I, uh Yeah. Okay, I was just I was just going to see if you had any idea who would even in a radio play play con, but um, I guess that's one for down the line. Well, I've got some questions from people uh, from over your, now. I kind of hopscotched, and I'll I'll. Um, well, we've uh, got six minutes, so yes, we got six minutes, and I want to. What am I doing here? Um, I did want to share screen and ask you a couple of things. Sure, sure. And, and one of them is a question that kind of comes in from Andrew Chang, but also let me boom get to any relation to Clink to General Chang. <laughs> oh, he wishes. Uh, you've not heard him ask questions until you've heard it in the original Klingon. Okay, uh, there we go. Um, just stepping through, there's you on the crew. Uh, this Robert is the Salen. thing that. Yes, Robert Salen back there. This is a and this is a color picture. So could you tell us what was originally you had a baby in the script and people have thought this was Khan's son, but I don't think it was. But what was can you give us the definitive on why it was included and what happened to it in the end? Well, let me interrupt you and tell you that the word definitive does not belong in any discussion of either art or biography. Uh, there's no such thing. OK, uh, I can I, I will give you an answer, which is uh, I don't think we ever thought of it in terms of Khan's child. All I wanted was to show that they were reproducing mm -hmm. and that there that there was a baby. But, you know, I sort of screwed it up in the shooting. So we cut it out. Oh, OK, there wasn't. I read somewhere where supposedly someone thought, gee, if they're all killed 
on the state on gamma regular or whatever happens to the rest of his crew that that means we're killing babies and somebody got but that sounds like it wasn't part of the equation no. at all. okay i'm just uh flipping through here if you see something that's good for a minute or two story um these guys i mean you've i know we've talked obviously over the years you talked about shooting these and all. this is a very weird uh bad chemical shot but i love it because it has has d in it um and just some fun stuff here and i love this picture for some reason uh and i love that set doesn't get enough what did you think or had you yeah i know you were upset about the uh later on you were upset about the reshoot and you realized later on that you shouldn't have been but in the moment you were not happy about them making the chance that spock had lived and took take away the drama of the death were you were you aware of the people when gene leaked that spock had died this whole consumer campaign and and the no the, was no, that totally I, off your radar screen um i didn't know anything about it all i knew was you know one day getting a letter that said if spock dies you die <laughs> oh, really? just, it sounds just like a you know presidential campaign these days um But no, I I didn't hear till years later, the the, mm -hmm. the story. I don't know if it's true that that Gene Roddenberry had bruited about Spock's death. Mm. Um, here's a question. Another one from uh, Andrew, on especially on four and on six. How much influence did you have on the tone of the music? They each had their composers. Uh, was it known or conveyed by you as to the tone of the music while you were shooting? I'm thinking conveyed, you know, to, conveyed to whom? Um, did you basically, did you have any input on what you were thinking and what you'd say? Gosh, I'd really like, I mean, as a director in a Star Trek franchise movie, were you able to look at the composers and say, gosh, here's what I, I'm, I'm shooting for, or here's what I wish the tone would be, or? The answer is totally... I come from a family of professional musicians. My grandfather was in the Boston Symphony in the violin, first violins for 25 years, starting under Pierre Monteux and later under Kusevitsky. My mother was a concert pianist. My father was an excellent amateur pianist. He could sight read any piece of music you put in front of him. My sister teaches the violin here in Beverly Hills. A middle sister of mine is an okay pianist. I'm sure she would be okay. And, and I used to be an okay pianist. Um, and my knowledge of what we'll call serious music, I think is fairly encyclopedic. Conductors, orchestras, composers. I have a huge collection. I once thought of titling a memoir of mine everything i know i learned from reading the backs of record jackets uh because that was my geeky idea of a good time is to come home and and read what was on the back cover so when i chose jamie horner and later when i chose cliff eidelman mm -hmm. i was very specific about what i wanted i said to jamie this is a movie about the ocean this is about the navy listen or re-listen to uh, Debussy La Mer and and give me nautical give me undulating stuff and when I got to Cliff Eidelman because on that movie we could no longer afford Jamie <laughs> you couldn't call him Jamie anymore you had to call him James right I only called him Jamie. He, he went the he went the way of Jerry Goldsmith, out of our price range. Um, but with Cliff, I sa said, um, "Think Stravinsky, Firebird." I said, "I'm tired of the rumty tum, Star Wars, Star Trek marches. This is a movie about an alien, mysterious." Uh, somber people give me something like the opening to firebird and we'll go from there 
And that's what he did. And that's what we did. All right. Well, our hour is up. Let me ask you one tiny thing. And this may, may, may be the kind of unfair question to throw. I'm once again pointing at your memoir here about the, the Trek movies and those years and the things in and around. Is there anything since you wrote this that you've either thought of or realized you wish you'd put in or didn't put in for a certain reason? Well, how about things I might have wanted to take out? Oh, OK. Such as? Oh, I don't know. I just thought that was, you know, another <laughs> way of, you know, um, you know, I really don't know because I haven't read the book in many, many years. Okay. Um, because it feels like you've been doing a lot more talking about Star Trek since this came out the last 10, 12 years than maybe at the time well, you wrote it. Well, they won't so. let me stop. So it's like bedtime stories. Um, I it's taken me a long time to sort of make peace with Star Trek, to understand it. A while ago, at the beginning of this hour, I said that thanks to Hornblower, I found a way to do it. But I didn't fully grasp what's important about it, what's wonderful about it, what's encouraging about it. For a very, very long time, the uh, not being the sharpest knife in the drawer, the the international, uh, intergenerational cast, the intergender cast, the the Russian and the African American and the and the Japanese and so all that kind of went right by me and yet it was staring me in the face and the notion which one can either subscribe to or not that human beings are capable of coming together to do good things um, hmm. is perhaps one that is useful to us something to shoot for at the beginning of this hour I said I had been to Panama. I'd seen the canal. I'd seen what human beings working together can do. Mind you, 20,000 of them died building that thing. Mm -hmm. But a canal like a bridge brings people together. And maybe Star Trek on a good day can do that as well. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. And what's the new uh, Sherlock book coming out? Sherlock Holmes and the Telegram from Hell. <laughs> no, really. What's the real title? That's the title. <laughs> it's an awesome title. And that's number six. Six. I think it's six. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll be this Nick, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight and being part of my this is my eighth anniversary uh big show. So thank you for doing this. It's a pleasure. You did a great job. <laughs> well, we tried. Anyway. Good night. Everybody hang on. Don't look. Oh, unmute and tell Nick uh, good night, unless he's already gone. He's gone. Thank you, Nick. Oh, he's there. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. Okay. I think you got some of those. I did. Oh, <laughs> said the voice from the dark. Thank you, sir.